Welcome back, everyone. Yes, please find your seat. So we are entering the second program, uh, solid state of the art, um, no pun intended. Uh, we're going to have a conversation now between Trevor McFedris. Perfect. Great. And Arif Cornvate. Cornvate. Yes. Yeah, less good than perfect, but almost. Um, they're going to talk about many interesting topics first, you know, among themselves, and then we're going to open to the audience both on Discord and here in the audience. Um, just want to repeat for the people on the live stream, you can join the Discord and ask questions so you don't feel the FOMO. So, Arif Conveit is a PhD candidate at the Kim Research Group on Critical Artificial Intelligence at the Karlsruhe University of Arts, and is now gonna run an MFA, a Sandberg Institute, called Artificial Times around music, sound, and AI. Trevor McFedris is the founder of Friends with Benefits, uh, the Web3 First Social DAO, the founder and former CEO of Dapper Collectives. And they both have done many more things than these, but we're going to keep it at that, and I'm sure we're going to dive in your experiences. So please give an applause to Arif and Trevor. Uh, I think we're going to start this stuff with some context. I, I made some slides. You guys can figure out what I've been up to. Hopefully, this guy works. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, there we go. Oh, actually, we got another pretty visualization. It's so good, I got to let it run. Okay, Kevin, sorry. We're going to boop. Uh, that was me. That's, that's me. And this is uh, some of my work. Uh, some of you may know little Michaela uh, and Friends of Benefits. I'm going to jump to this next slide for those of you that don't know Michaela. This is actually Michaela's music in a recap we did in, in 2019. There's a lot of goodies that are out there afterwards, but I wanted to play this because it highlights some of her music. This is a Dina Marco remix of one of her songs. And we're going to talk about some of her music, but as you can tell, um, Brett was a transmedia studio based in Los Angeles. We created Michaela and a whole cast of characters with the dream of building a modern Disney. If you were going to start telling stories now, you probably wouldn't start telling them in, in comic books or in film. You'd go where young people were, and we believe that was social media. And so we kind of recognized that we could build this, this kind of uh, uh, this transmedia universe inside of social networks that were traditionally reserved or traditionally considered to be reserved for uh, non-fiction content and create fiction content. And we could embed some kind of narratives and social themes inside of these things. So in this video, you have all kinds of different clips. Some of her with her friends, like Millie Bobby Brown and other kind of like uh, real world celebrities. And then some of them, the other characters in the universe. And uh, because we got a short one, I'll probably just jump through it. This is Michaela on the cover of High Snobiety, Wired. She had, you know, Le Fischel covers, all kinds of fancy magazines. And what was really cool was recognizing that she became a celebrity in the real world. She was the first digital talent ever signed to CAA, which represents like the, you know, the biggest celebrities in Hollywood. Um, Nick Knight shot this 032C cover. This Wonderland cover was really cool as well. And then uh, in parallel, I've been interested in crypto for a long time. I started this, this DAO called Friends with Benefits really as an experiment. This was kind of a snarky New York Times cover that, that I liked. Uh, it was sort of like the backhanded compliments from, from the press. Uh, we also started this social network. And when I say we, I mean literally the DAO. What's kind of cool about the DAO is that I have very little oversight and very, very little direction. Um, they wanted to build this, and the product team, which is, is a, a members, built this really impressive social product that feels better to me than you know, even Twitter, which seems to be barely running these days. So what you'll see is there's user profiles. Because it's DAO specific, you can look at members in the community outside just like a Discord handle. You can see some of the things they participated in. You can also see all the events that we're doing. You can use Gatekeeper to get into the events. We have like member discounts for certain products we've built. And then the DAO governance votes there, which is really important. Kind of centering that governance piece was a really important part of the application. And so uh, that's short and sweet, but uh, a little overview of what I've been up to. This is the event at WB Fest, which is annual as well. And would love to see you guys there in person. Thank you so much. Woo, thank you. Um, I think we, we can unpack this over the coming minutes, but um, can I ask you really quickly, what's a DAO for some people that might not know? 
Yeah, I, I always describe it with kind of a, a, a cheeky little line. I think of a DAO as a group chat with a balance sheet. Um, but effectively, what we've built is, is, a, is a community of people that are making decisions about a pool of capital that exists primarily on chain. And we use that capital to do whatever the community wants. That is throw IRL events, that is build software products, and that is also you know do uh, interesting things like help rebuild skate parks. Um, and so really, pool of capital that the community can decide to do whatever they want with. And you started, um, so I want to talk about the past first. Um, you started working around 2008, right? Uh, so in the aftermath or like in the middle of the financial crisis actually that um, we probably kind of live in today still, but how was it to, to start working and how, what did you start with? Yeah, it feels especially topical with like the SDB collapse and kind of like the, the trials and tribulations in the states right now. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really know what I was kind of uh, you know graduating into, but effectively recognized you know a decade later that I've been like swimming as fast as I can to effectively stay in the same place. Uh, especially as you know, I, I kind of was in the culture industries for the first part of my life. My first trip to Amsterdam was as a recording artist. I was, was in a rap group called Swayze, and we came here to play shows. And I remember just being blown away by like the hordes of beautiful tall people running at you on bikes or whatever and dodging them. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, what I've recognized since is I have peers now, you know, especially in FWB that are 25 years old have kind of only known this up and to the right economy where they can go out and, and, and buy a JPEG and a few years later have a million dollars. And that's, you know, a, a far cry from what I knew when I was 20, 21 years old, you know, doing whatever I could to survive and make creative work. And, and what were you doing after um, after coming here as a as a music artist or musical artist? Yes, yeah, so we came as a band um, that was kind of hodgepodge together, and you know, like like a lot of bands, we're like having these passive aggressive arguments in the tour bus with a little bit of success, and so we broke up and went went our own ways. And I started producing music and, and touring as a solo artist. I was kind of a trained software engineer, so in parallel, I was building software products for artists. You know, at the time it was like Facebook light gates where, you know, like, like my Facebook page for a free MP3 if you remember some of those monstrosities. Um, and, I, and I caught the attention of um, some folks that were working at this thing called Spotify in Sweden. And so th they were kind of looking to bring on someone who could be this, this liaison, this kind of interface between a bunch of like geeky engineers and the artist community, and, and that kind of felt like me. Um, I've been signed to a major label with my, my rap group, um, and I had been you know, signed to Indies as a, as a solo artist. And uh, at, at the time, I had just finished a global tour opening for Katy Perry and was like pretty exhausted of like sleeping in tour buses and navigating cold, dark arenas and was looking forward to like healthcare and like going to the gym and like trying to have a girlfriend. And so the idea of having some stability at Spotify sounded quite nice. And I, and I joined Spotify, was there, I believe, like end of 2010 to like 2015 or so, like four, a little more than four years. And was really excited by, by Dan's vision. Um, I think the reality was a lot of that didn't pan out because they didn't create as much leverage as they would have liked. Uh, and, and then, you know, post Spotify, I spent uh, um, uh, six, eight months burning through my savings trying to build bread in the transmedia studio and was able to then embrace venture capital and kind of see that through. Did it feel like switching sides, moving to Spotify? Like, what did you see, what, what you didn't experience before as an artist? Uh, I mean, I was talking to like Matt Dryhurst and Hollywood about this ages ago, but it actually felt like an opportunity to be innovative and creative. Like it, it felt kind of, uh, it, it, it felt bizarre that I had tried to be a creative and had these really fixed constraints. At the time, the music industry was really dominated by fear. It, it, the industry was over and piracy had destroyed it. And I was kind of forced to do pop sessions and make three and a half minute songs that felt structured for radio and, you know, copy whatever Lady Gaga song was popular at the moment. And, and moving into tech, I was all of a sudden surrounded by all of these brilliant people. The other thing is like I, I was signed to Interscope in, in 2008 and you'd meet these, you know, digital marketing people who were like, we're gonna, you know, post on blogs. And you're like, that's the marketing strategy? Like what? It was silly. Like I knew more than those people about digital, and I when I entered Spotify, there were these brilliant people that had brilliant ideas, and they were executing quite rapidly. So, a being around a, a, a team that hadn't suffered the brain drain the music industry, the cultural industry had had was really compelling. And beyond that, having resources to do stuff, like so many of you know the experience of like fighting for three hundred dollars to make a music video, and having seemingly infinite venture capital to take shots and be expected to fail, was really liberating. And so the idea that you could take risks and do things and innovate felt bizarre when I thought this was kind of like suits and kind of venture backed corporate land and, and, and meanwhile in like Silver Lake we were kind of forced to fit into a very very narrow idea of what kind of kind of commercial art or art was at the time. 
And you did just say piracy kind of ruined the music industry, right? Is that... Uh, I think it, it ruined the music industry, but like I'm only here because of piracy. You know, I was I grew up I, I, yeah I grew up in Iowa and wanted to do things and recognized quite quickly that I could pirate Photoshop or Fruity Loops or you know Ableton and start making and effectively have the same tool set as as the pros. And so, I, I it, you know it, it's one of the things that I kind of go back and forth on constantly. But you know this idea that information wants to be free and that. You know, artists should be compensated are probably one of the reasons I got really into to Web3 and, and NFTs and the idea of media being individually ownable but also universally accessible. The, the argument of piracy is really interesting, right? Because often we are indeed told that, yeah, that ruined uh, the music industry, etc. But then now the argument seems to shift to that, that Spotify has ruined the music industry or streaming ruined the music industry. How do you, how do you feel about that? I definitely think Spotify's, uh, in a, in a, I mean, I have a lot of people there that are still wonderful, but I think it's probably been net negative for artists overall. And I think not because of their intentions, but because of the constraints put on them by, by rights holders and, and by, by major labels. Um, I'm, I mean, we talked about this a bit before, but I'm definitely concerned about what, what AI, both on the kind of uh, uh, content moderation and discovery side and on the generative side will, will mean for that platform in the next 10 years. I, I, I think we're going to be forced to see a, a shift, uh, especially in how music is mediated, because I think you kind of get these, these, these negative feedback loops similar to the ones that like Netflix has now. I think people kind of woke up. I mean, people didn't really care about their town square, their newspaper, candidly. And so when Facebook had these kind of negative feedback loops, the feedback was like, boo, this thing sucks. I think people really care about media. And people are waking up on Netflix and being like, wait, this is just chef's table for everything now? Huh. Like that format was compelling and the data kind of led to them making more of those things and people like those things. But when they wake up, man, it, it, to me, it doesn't feel entirely similar from like, you know, the 90s when people recognized that like fast food would satiate them, but was, was hollow and there were no nutrients. Right. And so I think people will effectively have this moment where they're like, OK, Spotify has created this music. That people have optimized music for Spotify so it can exist in lots of these playlists. And so you have a Spotify core that is indie, but also coffee shop friendly, but also hip hop vaguely, but also, and it can live as this kind of like gray smattering of nothing across all these things. And people, I think, will wake up and be like, I really want something with nutrients. And so I think what you're seeing with the kind of emergence of Bandcamp and even artists that don't stream well but are touring quite well is people seeking out those, those, those different things. What's, um, what's interesting about this Spotify debate is that um, what we've seen earlier t today is GANs, right? So generative art. And that's mostly talked about or like displayed in terms of like visual art at the moment. But you can also generate music already. And that will essentially allow uh, these like, streaming giants like Spotify to kind of like take the artists of the equation, right? Because the problem now is that they uh, have to pay royalties. And they are very thin, the royalties, as, as you maybe know, if you are... Uh, if you ever uploaded anything to a streaming platform, the, the return you get is very, very slim. But um, yeah, so then the coffee shop playlist, the kind of lounge music, that, that can be like mimicked basically, right? It can be imitated and um, that opens up a whole different space, right? I mean, I think like in music, for example, it seems like guitars are everywhere now <laughs> and that's probably for a reason, right? Totally, I think there's a barrier to entry there. Um, and, I, and I don't hate this phenomenon. I think it's, it's maybe a bit problematic to express and maybe to extend the fast food <laughs> metaphor, but I think we're going to have like the Chipotleification of music, right? Where like you can have this really kind of piss poor fast food uh, race to the bottom and then, you know, AI will effectively allow us to level up, you know, where you have this like Chipotle of generative music that is better than like maybe a human's, but the two Michelin stars are, are effective, chefs are effectively going to be elevated, right? Because it's going to be pretty easy to be good. I think it's going to be very hard to be be great and I think when everything is good you really create space for people that are special and so we've lived in this bizarre moment where it, to me it seems like we have this hyper fragmented mainstream which prevents us from having a kind of cohesive underground as well you know, we were talking last night about like you know post you know post post internet art and what came after it and this kind of like whole and then you know and even in kind of weird music 
who's interesting and, 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 and popular, and it's like Arca, you know, Arca's mid-30s, and you're like, oh, okay, well, Caroline Polochek, and it's like, yeah, totally, you know, like, there, there seems to be this, this gap there, and I'm hoping with a kind of a, a more consistent mainstream that is maybe, like, uh, cemented by generative work, you can have this backlash. You can effectively have this, this like, cohesive underground that could push against something, because right now it's so nebulous. What you push against? It's all blob. Mm. Push against the blob. <laughs> Um, good quote. Um, I have another quote for you from an interview with, uh, with you that uh, I think Jordan Wolfson, the artist, did. And you said, it's incredibly hard to be creative and make a living right now, and I'd like, to, I'd like it to be easier. Um, was it easier? For example, like pre-crisis, was there more, more room to, to do that? You know, I don't know exactly. I think if you were of a certain ilk and, and, and maybe kind of had the, the relationships, it certainly was easier. I think part of the, the discontent you see in the States amongst a certain set of like coastal elites is they, they can recognize that it's gotten harder and they can't put their finger on why. Um, and so the, the, the idea of democratizing these things has been, has been great in some senses and that we've had, you know, Folks like Tyler, the creator, emerge, you know, like in OAP. I remember that being so popular and them kind of breaking through. A lot of those channels are gone now. Um, but I also do meet people in Hollywood who live in like $10 million houses who had like one hit single in the 90s. It was like a fluke. And you're like, what? This is possible? And so seemingly it was easier if you had relationships. Um, but but I, I think there are, there are hopefully, you know, generationally, if we can get past this like malaise and apathy, we can like build better ways to identify people that are actually innovating and creating new things and then reward them such that like we, we kind of fill that gap. I think a lot of young people saw that if you were an interesting artist, like you couldn't make a living and you just became like a podcaster or a person with a startup. So they were like, why don't I just like have a podcast or a startup? Like why do the other thing? And so I think if we can incentivize creativity and innovation and kind of champion those people, hopefully people recognize that these are like very, very virtuous, life's worth living, and that like having this, being this divine bridge, just this divine connection between, you know, the, the holy and, and connecting people to that holy via art is, is really noble and, and worth doing. And, and, and even if like the, the commercial awards aren't as obvious now, and so that's kind of how I spend a lot of my time these days is, is you know, being a champion of the divine. Can you talk a little bit about how the divine enters the, the platform, the friends of Bene friends with benefits, sorry, that um, that you presented briefly, but maybe not everyone knows also how it works, what's happening. Yeah, so friends with benefits is is a DAO as you mentioned earlier, but effectively it's it's a social network that is that is token gated, meaning you need tokens to enter. And, and the idea is that when I started it was um, you. Know, a lot of young people had never known an internet where value accrued to the edges of the network. So some of you, you know, who live web one may have experienced some of these kind of like utopian ideas. And if you'd only known post Facebook world, you've seen a lot of the value these networks create accrue to, you know, Peter Thiel and Mark Zuckerberg, investors and founders and early employees of these startups, instead of the people that were creating all the value, which is, you know, the photos, the text, whatever, these aren't new ideas. And so in trying to, you know, talking to friends like Jesse Walden and Toby Shoren, you know, kind of riffing over dinner. It was like, are there simple mechanics we could highlight to kind of explain to people that the value they're creating in these things could, could, be, could be repatriated back to them? And the simple idea was, you know, what if we created a social network where there were a fixed amount of tokens? And if you held those tokens, you had access. Thus, when you created value in, in, in this space, the value would be reflected back in that token as there was more demand on a fixed supply of tokens. And that was really a really, really simple mechanic. I thought it would be like a six-week experiment. People would get in and be like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to fork this and, and make something with like a stronger, more persistent set of tokenomics. Um, the reality is that like the timing w was right around when you couldn't escape like NFT talk on Clubhouse or whatever. And I think a lot of people saw crypto as being these like neckbeard libertarians that didn't want to be around if they were like in culture. And so they recognized that FWB could be the space where 
you could, you know, meet Lucy Bull or John Raffman or at the time Virgil Abloh or even Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park. And so it was like, oh, here's this place where I can ask questions about how to be a creative person in this emergent Web3 thing and not be inundated with like when moon, like in pumping token talk. And, and, and so FWB really has become this kind of like cultural uh, uh, cornerstone in, in Web3. And I'm very thankful for the community because people give me credit because we have this like founder driven world, but I literally do very little. The community does it all. What are they doing at the moment? What's happening there? Uh, so many things. So we have another event. Uh, we do the first FWB Fest, which like a great example of, of the power of a DAO is I was pretty hostile to in-person events. I'm like an extremely online person who doesn't really like doing the socializing thing that much. But everyone really wanted to meet each other, which I didn't really get. Um, but then they started throwing events and people loved them. And we threw a festival last year that had one of Tricks Point Never headline. I mean, really, the, the dream of the festival was like, what if we just put like our most interesting, creative people and, and the most like intelligent people that we knew in a room and just saw what happened? Or really, like in, in nature and saw what happened. And you know, friends of, of a lot of you, I'm sure, Eric Hu, David Rudnick, Kia Cutler, um, uh, OPN played, uh, Serpent with Feet, a, a ton of really incredible music acts as well. Uh, Pussy Riot performed. Um, just outside Los Angeles in this beautiful forest space. So there's the, fest, there's the events. We're going to do a bigger event next year. Um, beyond that, the software products. We mentioned the social network, which is very cool. We built a tool called Gatekeeper that a lot of events use to get into the events. Uh, beyond that, like I, I'm really a, a fan of, of the, the Discord itself. Like It was the first thing we built, but the community is so strong that I spent a lot of time in like the skincare channel. I had, I had no idea how incredible skin carriers, all the products, all of the things. It's been an incredible journey for myself as a dermatologist in the community and I like give you free tips. So that's been a big value add for me. Um, the parenting channel is quite cute. I'm not a parent, but one day I hope to be a parent. So this can be a dating thing as well, I guess right now. This is, hi, I'm Trevor, I'm 37. Um, <laughs> But the, the parenting channel is, is super, super cool. Like it's, it's fun to watch a new generation of parents figure out how to raise children and how, how, how trying it can be and have a community to support them when I think otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't have that. And so lots of different facets. If anyone wants to join, I've got tokens. Just ping me afterwards. I'll get you some tokens and we'll onboard you. Amazing. Um, earlier we talked about, um, about musical releases, right? And I think it's an interesting conversation about the kind of form that they take, um, how they can live on a network like, like uh, FWB or how they can live on the, on the internet without um, like a relation to, for example, a vinyl record, right? And um, what, what do you think is happening in that space and what's interesting there for you? Sorry, start with, with music and how it can live? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we were talking earlier, I, I'm, I started a kind of like Eurodance project in Miami with my friend who's a Spanish singer named Cablito. And we we're putting out our first music, the first music I put out in like almost 10 years. And it's been interesting to think about how we would release it. Um, there's a, a, a record label DAO in Berlin called uh, With FM, and they're co-releasing the new Brutalismus 3000 single uh, with Live From Earth. And to me, it's so interesting that an, that an, an act like Brutalismus, which has an incredible amount of momentum and hype, would work with a DAO to release a record. Um, you know, Audius, I think, has you know, millions of people tuning in to their, to their, their, their kind of Web3 native streaming platform. Beyond that, it seems like there are artists that are choosing to opt out. You know, Bandcamp, et cetera, has allowed people to say, I don't want to participate in this game. I'm going to just release records my way and build a, you know, a touring audience in a way that feels uh, a bit more traditional. And so for us, we're trying to make sense of how we navigate this thing and how we do something that feels credible. You know, in talking to my friends that are managers, they're like, you got to make two to three TikToks a day. And mashups are really popular on TikTok. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I want to like mash up like Pitbull with my Eurodance song. Like I love that in my heart, but maybe I do that in my private time. So it's, it, it, I think it's, it's incredibly trying, but also exciting. I love these, these moments of chaos where it feels like things are beginning to reset and there are opportunities for those people who want to take risks to like reap big rewards. So we're probably going to try and do some different things. I kind of want to build it around WhatsApp. Um, so maybe I'll give you guys a QR code later to join our WhatsApp or something cool. Yeah, what's really interesting is that, that there seems to be a moment where, I mean, we often imitate old formats, right? Like the album, people release the album on Bandcamp, that, but the album actually comes from the vinyl record, right? It has a certain amount of like, play time, let's say. But then now people really experiment with something that is not skew morph, so that doesn't really mimic the, the old formats. 
Um, but I think I got, just got a sign that we, uh, we are opening this for questions. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll go into the vortex of, of formats. Um, maybe is there something on Discord? Someone on Discord? No? Um, the Ooh. parenting channel is still asleep, probably. Skincare? Um, yeah, any skincare tips? <laughs> anyone in the room? There is a hand in the middle on the left. Hi, thank you for the for the great talk. Um, I wonder. I was really interested how you relate to little Michaela now. Like how? What is she, like? Do you, yeah. How do you relate to her? Because you, yeah, she is. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I would just be if you could allow. Gosh, me. there are legal constraints here as well. So I'm gonna try to like not. Uh, no, I mean like it's very interesting. It, it, oh gosh, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> I, so I think right now. I feel like my child has like grown up and gone to college and has like, you know, kooky professors uh, shaping her ideologies in, in, in ways that like maybe I'm not a huge fan of. But what was always fun about Michaela was it was like far more than, than me always. Like we had this team like Jessica Curry, who really was like the beating heart of that project, um, was able to, to give it so much life. Uh, I think that some of the dreams that we wanted to realize we weren't able to, and that's frustrating. But I think what's really cool is I'm seeing people who are inspired by it kind of pick up the torch and, and, and do things that we would have done. I mean, we got so many things wrong, and it was it was really exciting, and that was part of it, to like be first through the door and catch all the arrows and the backlash while simultaneously inspiring. You know, I, I, I say it often, but like the best part about that project really was having, you know, young queer non-binary kids from the Midwest say like, no one believes my identity is real, but every day I see someone that people say isn't real on the internet, like get all these accolades and do all these things and it really is inspiring. And so the dream for me was always just to build X-Men. For, you know, I was like a weirdo black kid in the Midwest who like played in hardcore bands and, and nobody liked it. So I was like, I, I, I had a story about mutants doing cool things. And so the idea was to try to create something that could outcompete you know, Logan and Jake Paul narratives and kind of embed some of that ethos in, in it. And so I think we did that pretty effectively and that was really the, the dream. And so I think my relationship with it now is I'm really excited about what we've done. I wish we could have, you know, seen some of it through, but you know, market forces, economic downturns, social interactions, we'll get there one day. Is there another question? Yeah, he all the way in the front. Sorry, I didn't want to take much space if there were other questions, but I found super inspiring when you were talking about Spotify and piracy. I was talking about copyright because there is always this notion of more copyright is more to the artist, and the problem is not uh, on, on creating more regulation or more rights, but the problem is in the middleman that's taking that uh, that richness. And I was super inspired what you were saying about Bankam, about the emerging forms of retribution, of the emerging business models. And also, it's very true what you were saying about uh, how they are kind of domesticating our tastes through content moderation and AI and the future of, of Spotify. Do coming you uh, from from kind of the recording industry and that background, do you see a path moving forward uh, from Web3, or, or should we annihilate copyright? It's a great question. I mean, that, that is the question, in my opinion. I, I kind of see, see two paths, right? You can um, you can either kind of like keep the pie fixed, right? Effectively, things where they are, and kind of remove those middlemen to increase the pie for artists, or you can kind of grow that pie. And, and the way I think you grow that pie, I mean, or, or a kind of a, a, a comp that I would use is like the fine art world, where effectively you have like these whales that can speculate, and you can kind of treat works I mean, with, with, with different kind of arbitrary value, value that they're, they're really kind of market priced. And I don't think it's like you know the utopian outcome, but what it does enable is for people to think on longer time horizons. And I think one of the challenges with primarily digital media is you had these platforms that we know are going to expire, right? Like, I don't think anyone thinks Spotify is going to be here in 100 years. Uh, one of the opportunities for blockchains is distributed networks have the ability to be around for hundreds of years. And so the same way I can make a bet on a, a fine art painter right now and say, like, look, people don't get it now, but in 40, 50 years, this person's gonna be recognized as a genius, and my $5,000, $10,000 will be millions of dollars. I think, you know, again, probably not the dream that like, you know, my socio-anarchist peers dream of, 
but allowing the market to speculate and create longer time horizons for artists allows us to move away from this immediacy economy, where if your, your media doesn't work right away, it's not valuable. And so allowing people to create more complex work allows you to kind of sit and grow, involved much the same way you had an experience with sitting with a painting for hours at a museum and watching it evolve will hopefully uh, enable like a more value to accrue the people that are making great stuff, but also for like more complex work, pardon me, uh, because we, we've got a lot, of, a lot of immediate work capturing a lot of attention. I'd love to see some complexity introduced and more nutrients to extend the really bad food metaphor. I don't know why I've done that. Um, there are two more questions. Just to, I just I just want to briefly like say that there is also um, something strange about copyright and about the notion of genius and that someone will be will be great, right? And that that of course companies capitalize on that, but also that's the way that the art work is uh, art world is usually kind of talked about is that there are some people that rise up and that they make genius work, whereas a lot of it is also community. It's us being here discussing things, and most artists will never become famous, famous, but they can live and they can research and they can work, and that's maybe what they want to do also, right? Yeah, we were talking about collectives last night and how hard it is for traditional institutions to work with collectives versus kind of like the individual artists. And one of the opportunities for, for me in kind of this emerging social and emerging Web3 stuff is, multi-signature wallets and identities, you know, individual identities, having you know, multiple people that can vote on decisions and then like put stuff into the world. So we had this really bizarre phenomenon where on web two, you had like Steakums and Coca-Cola talking to you as if they were one person. They were kind of forced to be this brand on networks designed for individuals. And so they'd be like, what's up guys? I'm so depressed today. And you'd be like, the Coca-Cola brand is depressed? And, and I think the idea of like creating networks that allow us to share media, but from the voice of collectives that we know are making decisions behind the scenes that are then being pushed to their collective account enables us to interface with collectives better. And so hopefully we can you know, build better, better, better architecture for collectives and for, for groups to work collectively through these things. There was a question in the front, I think, and oh, there's already one there, sorry. Yeah. We are also building our own DAO, the House of Electronic Arts. So I'm super interested also in your experience with the Friends of Bene with Benefits. Do you? I mean, it seems to me you really managed to make an autonomous organization where the, the, the collective really create their own events. But do you also cope with? Um, I mean, do you also manage some of the inputs? Um, what happens if you have some? Uh, um, how would you say uh, maybe uh, toxic events that wants to be created? Or do you have hacking? Or do you have like group of people trying to manipulate uh, the, the direction? Do you have any management at all in this DAO? Certainly, Top yeah. down, yeah. How do you do that? We think of it a lot like a city. Right? We effectively have like a tax base, which is you know, the pool of capital, but we also have rules. We have values that we've established, and we've had people that have done things that go against the rules, and we have a set of values, and a set of, uh, and we have a basically like committees that vote on what happened to them. And so we, we try to borrow a lot of things from you know, existing democracies, primarily. And when, when we learn what works and what doesn't, we iterate accordingly. Um, we, we have had, you know, hacks exist. We have had all kinds, and all the outcomes you can imagine. One thing that may be interesting for you is, all of it's very transparent online. We're throwing a festival and the entire budget is in our snapshot to be voted on. I don't know that you'd ever see Coachella's like operating budget and what they expect to make from it, but because it's a DAO, it's all very public. And so uh, maybe afterwards I can show you where you can see a lot of this stuff and how we had to deal with things, but community code of conduct, you know, we've had you know, membership committees that allow people to come in and deal with them when they want to go out. We have you know, very public budgets, you name it, it's, it's all there. And, and we're making a lot of mistakes in public that people hopefully can, can learn from. And, and really the dream is like, fork this thing, copy and paste the code, and go build what you see and how you'd want it to be, because that's the only way I think we evolve, is, is a lot of my composability. In the front. Yeah, you said something very beautiful at some point. Uh, you said that um, there is, like, uh, with the Web3, it enabled the possibility for exclusive ownership while also maintaining uh, public accessibility. Um, so I wanted to ask you like, if you can develop on that in terms of like, what are the various methodologies that you have uh, seen or explored within Web3 uh, to promote accessibility and dissemination of content while nonetheless enabling the artist through this exclusive thing. But, and what, what are the various forms of exclusivity that can be instantiated that do not actually prevent accessibility of the content? 
Yeah, you made a really good, great point earlier in the previous conversation as well, I believe, about scarcity. Something that I think a lot about. Um, you know, uh, the, the challenge for me as an artist has always been, like, I'm a little, you know, 90s script kitty hacker boy who want, who was, I'm here because of piracy. And I always wanted information to be free. But as I became an artist and recognized how challenging it was, you recognize that there was this tension, at least there was this idea that, you know, the more accessible your work was, the less valuable it was, and that all of the value was tied to its scarcity. And so these things live in opposition. The kind of alchemy or magic of, of non-fungible tokens is you effectively have this media that can be individually owned, but it's also available to be experienced by anyone everywhere. And so that you know, leads to you ask the question, like, why would someone own this thing if I can have the same value as anyone else? Well, because there's a collectible thing there, right? And, and that, to me, never really clicked. But and, and candidly, I was quite skeptical of NFTs for a very long time. Um, Jacob from Zora, actually, that's his line, that things can be individually ownable and universally accessible. And he's someone that really made this, 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 this click for me. This really important idea that you hear people talk about a lot in NFTs is that traditionally, copies of your artwork devalued your artwork. So an MP3 effectively was a copy of a copy of a copy of the original work. And the more of those there were, the less valuable these things were. In, in, in fine art, with like the Mona Lisa, you have this idea where the more that image is reproduced, the more valuable it becomes. And the question is, you know, why is that? I can see it on a t-shirt, I can see it in a textbook. Well, it's because we have this source of truth, right? We have this the Louvre that acts as this entity where you know this is this is the real deal. This is the one. And the way I really think about the blockchain effectively is like the Louvre. It's a source of truth where I can know that this JPEG I see in my Tumblr or my Instagram or whatever is a, is a copy of this real one that exists on chain. And the idea that someone would want that real one is the kind of weird status gamey is human psychology that I think allows it to accrue value to the individual while sharing all of that joy of the media with, with, with anyone. And so that, that's kind of the magic of that thing to me and why I get excited about NFTs. Um, we did have this kind of like global casino speculation thing that kind of muddied all of that, but hopefully with time, that important piece will kind of shine through. There is um, an essay from 2007 by Seth Price, Dispersion, that, that is really interesting to, to go back to now, actually, because I think he, in it, he writes that um, situating an artwork in a, like fixating it in space and time turns it into a monument, and then what if we could kind of disperse it and like have it endlessly accessible, right? But I don't know if that dream really came true, because there is something about NFT that, that still bugs me, I think is this kind of the authenticity that it instills, right? And that how, how it basically cuts authenticity from the object. That is um, not just an accessibility question, but it is also a kind of political thinking about authenticity that um, reminds me of other kind of politicized forms of, of genius and authenticity and kind of pure forms of art, right? And I'm not saying that NFTs are that, but they lend themselves, I think, to be to be used to these for these kind of operations of to talk about like the the artwork as something authentic. Yeah, I mean that's like one of those trade-offs, right? And I think in all of these different solutions, you're going to have trade-offs, and it's one of those things that I'm probably more comfortable with than some. But this this idea that like you know me as a young person who grew up in a small town in the Midwest had to drive an hour to get like a Misfits vinyl or you know, T-shirt or something, the idea that I could have access to all of this, all of these interesting ideas and things while still, you know, while still extending value to the person that creates, they want to make more things, to me really is, is a desired outcome. And if authenticity is, is shaved off and repurposed and speculated on, that's a bummer, but might be worth, might be worth, <laughs> the might be just by the end. Yeah, we're gonna have to, to write it out, I think, to yeah. see it. Is there another question maybe uh, in the back? One last. I'm saying five question. more questions. Just kidding. I think <laughs> you already got to ask a question, Floris, but there was one in the middle. Hello. Oh, sorry. I'm, yeah, I did not see that because there was someone sitting. Um, yeah, thanks for this. Something that we've been talking about at Trust lately is like what forms of collective voice are valuable and for what reason. And there seems to be this difference between a collective voice that tries to subsume everything into sameness versus a collective voice that somehow embraces the differences between individuals. And like hearing you introduce Lil Michaela and then talk about friends with benefits, I'm kind of struck by these very different approaches and like 
yeah, methodologies of curation. And I'm, I'm curious, like, because I think a fear that I have of maybe like a direct democratic approach to curation is that you end up with gray media. You end up with the boiling things down to this kind of mean culture that appeals a little bit to a lot of people but isn't kind of taking risks. And so I'm curious, like, yeah, what you think these, or like, what is the value of these democratic forms of curation? Like, are there risks to it? And do you think Lil Michaela could have ever been produced by a DAO? I personally don't think Michaela could have been produced by a DAO. I think, you know, the idea of progressive decentralization seems the best for media. I mean, to me, I think you only get to have like differentiated voices, and you're absolutely right. That a direct democracy to me, if you've, if you've ever interfaced with a record label and had every person in the company tell you what color your shoes should be, like, you, you know, how, how kind of boring and how quickly you get this race to like average there. Uh, but the idea of, of starting with, uh, you know, someone or a, a small group of people that have an idea, proving that idea, and then having people kind of establishing a core set of values, the mission, and aligning people. I mean, I'm pretty like Silicon Valley brain poisoned, but it's a really effective way of kind of aligning people and, and, and pushing people in the right direction. So in, in, in Brud, it really was this kind of like top down autocracy, you know, where like I, I was calling the shots and bringing in people. And if you didn't fall in line, like you had to go. And I think we were able to execute pretty effectively. That said, it's not perfect, right? I think you watch a lot of institutions struggle because, you know, there are all kinds of uh, power structures that exist outside of the organization as well. You've seen plenty of CEO deal with like blue check mark employees, like talking shit and like, you know, that sucks. And they have to deal with the ramifications of that for them. Doesn't suck for the people that, you know, are, are, are we're working there, but it sucks for the person who's trying to see something through potentially. Um, and then the flip side of that is, you know, in the DAO where I think we've been really effective. And this is where I often, you know, talk to the people in the DAO is that you can have a mission and you have to allow tactics to emerge and I think pour gas on the tactics that work. I often think of, I talk about it like Trump versus Hillary. Democrats were so obsessed with like top-down strategy. And what I was seeing on 4chan were just trolls be like, lol, we're gonna try this. And like it would work and they all would race after it and do more of it. And so like enabling like little armies with tactics to kind of act in more guerrilla ways and having top-down strategies to me is a way more effective, uh, a, a, a way to, to like pursue a, a, a more kind of flat hierarchy than having these really kind of top-down robust strategies. Mission and troll armies, let them go, is how, how I would go. Yes, thanks a lot, guys. Weird way to end it, but. I mean, yeah, pouring fire on, uh, pouring gas on the fire. So now you're off the hook, so you can uh, take a different seat. Oh, cool. Probably Thank thanks, you. Thanks a lot for all the insights. Um, the hot seat is now for uh, Jin Ha Lee, who is going to join me here on stage. Uh, a few words about Jin Ha. He's an award-winning designer, inventor, and entrepreneur uh, from South Korea. He's co-founder and chief product officer of Spatial. You may know it as Spatial.io, a metaverse for culture that brings people together for art exhibits and cultural events. So Gina, please take it away. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, well, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, my name is Jin Ha Lee. I'm a co-founder and present uh, at, this, at this metaverse platform company called Spatial or spatial.io. So um, today we'll be talking about art and where it's headed to with this advancements of the, the metaverse. And uh, so the art is interesting. It's, it's a way to tell our stories. It's a way to question who we are and where we're headed to. Uh, and it's also an attempt to answer the same questions. Um, so today we'll be talking about the future of art uh, but before we get to the topic, we're going to talk about the past for a little bit. All right, we'll, actually, we're just going to be watching this opera for 15 minutes. That's it. Uh, just kidding. Um, so this is a video clip of the famous opera, Aida. Um, so for thousands of years, so people have been 
uh, coming together and singing together, celebrating with each other. And this is how we used to communicate with each other and how we tell our stories and form the societies. Uh, and through that process, we became a part of uh, stories that are greater than ourselves. Um, so fast forward thousands of years later, we're doing the same thing, but in a slightly different form, right? Yes, the internet happened, which is amazing because we can be connected with anywhere, uh, with anyone. And this is amazing that we're in real time, can talk to anybody, you know, share our passion about the skincare. And uh, <laughs> um, so, yes, sharing videos and images are amazing. Um, and, but it's not quite the same as sharing the space and feeling the presence of each other and sharing the experience. That's why we're all gathering here and you know, listening to the talk together, socializing with each other in the same space. So the internet has to evolve. And that's where the idea of metaverse comes in. So the metaverse is a shared virtual space that can be accessible from anyone, any, anywhere online, according to ChatGPT. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of different ways to think about the metaverse, right? Uh, it, is it like a boring games in disguise, or it's just like a reincarnation of MySpace? Um, but uh, the, for spatial, uh, we really think the metaverse is the future of the internet that we know. And um, so the idea is that anyone, anyone can, uh, oops. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so anyone can um, share their, create the 3D experiences and share it online very easily. Um, so people can come in, hang out, have fun. Artists can have exhibits, like people can play games together. Uh, this is like a new way to, to socialize and communicate and express yourselves and form communities with each other. So it is, to, for us, it is the future of internet and that's the next, the natural evolution, the next step of the, today's internet. So if you really zoom out and, and look at this, the metaverse with the lens of what is happening to these communication technologies is that, so we're basically moving from this era of sharing information uh, and we're moving into this era of sharing experiences. So instead of sharing text, ideas and videos and who you are, instead of doing that, you can actually experience things you're experiencing with each other online anywhere. So that's the core uh, thing that's happening in this, in this advancement of the communication technologies these days. Uh, and that's what, why Spatial is focusing on allowing people to easily publish their experience. Like artists can actually host uh, amazing art exhibits without buying any land and like instantly share with each other. You know, gamers, game builders can actually publish their games without requiring the players to download any games. Um, so it has to be, it has to be accessible online and easily accessible by anybody. Um, so what does that mean to artists, right? That's the topic today. And what does it mean to the clicker? Okay, there we go. So um, it's, it's changing the notion of distance, not surprisingly. So um, actually, Spatial started as a collaboration platform. It's, it's a productivity platform instead of a platform for creators and artists. So when we started as like VR collaboration platform and the pandemic hit, and, and during the pandemic, there's so many people who reached out to us and say, hey, we wanna, we wanna use Spatial to really feel connected with each other. But the interesting thing is the majority of people who reached out during the pandemic was not companies or not like office workers. It was artists and, and creators who, was, who couldn't really have their exhibit anymore because of the lockdown. So the needs to hold this exhibit was so, so strong and, and share that with people. So artists, art students, museums, they started picking it up and, and really create this amazing experiences with very kind of the easy experience and then share it online on their Twitter and that became like sort of like a big um, 
sort of growth driver for our platform like two or three years ago. Um, and they can eventually sell the art. So for example, the Christie's auction, um, they, the Christie's auctions um, had like the first NFT fully on-chain drop and, and auction uh, in the metaverse. And they chose to do that on Spatial, for example, and they had this invited these artists who were talking about the story about their, their, their artwork have like more than 2,000 people visited over time, uh, which became like big success for them. And, and it's been really amazing to see how a platform can be used to help like artists to tell a story without the constraints of distance and time. Speaking of time, uh, it's not just about you know traveling, uh, uh, cr connecting across the distance, but it actually helps the artists to travel through the times. So. This, this is one of my favorite pieces um, um, that's hosted on Spatial. It's a retrospective exhibition of the photographer Lee Yun Ki, uh, designed by Emba Studio. And you can actually feel it's the replication of the, the, the buildings that artists were working at. And you can actually feel that old texture of this Korean house, like almost like a wooden columns that's kind of rotten. And you can really share the breath um, with the original artists who, who had this idea of what their kind of universe should feel like. And, and it's really about connecting with the ideas that's in one person's mind with people who are experiencing that world through the, you know, with the glimpse of the world through the lens of art. And it's a big plus that you don't need to worry about the gravity in the metaverse, of course. <laughs> so that leads to the next topic, which is uh, dimension. So it's not just, the metaverse is not just allowing you to replicate what you can do in the physical world into the online world, but it also allows you to you know, have a completely different, it makes it possible to, for, for a completely different form of art to happen. So this artist, Renaud, uh, who is building the entire universe with his idea of the world on spatial, he's, like, he's building these articulated geometries with the help of AI to, to build a universe like a, you know, spaces and avatars and uh, a lots of um, experiences between the objects and avatars so that people who follow his artwork can actually now come in and experience like what he thinks is sort of like a, the, the core idea of you know, where the world is headed to. And you know, there's some, a lot of this, this group of artists, Benny Orr and Cyril Anselin, like they're reimagining reimagining the meeting place and this is the maybe the future of how we're gonna meet each other like floating in the space and and um, really appreciate um, you know like the sky and and with the help of also some generative AI and they're redesigning the whole idea of like how people you know can hang out with each other and have exhibits and, and meet with this amazing geometry so um, but I think my favorite piece is this one, not my favorite clicker, but uh, okay. So uh, it's not just about creating new ideas, but it, some of the artists are taking, you know, the really f existing kind of known art and taking it into another level, like with like platforms like Spatial. So this work um, is actually um, based on the original. It, like iconic media art piece called Tada Ik Sun, um, which is a, a work of uh, Nam Jun Pak, which is iconic uh, uh, media artist of 20th century. So the Ember Studio actually took that to another level in spatial, um, and almost like putting it into a universe and like having this interactive kind of experiences, allowing people to uh, really experience this like iconic media art in a very different way, just by having. Um, yeah, having this the, the direct relationship with the art itself, you can actually. Um, there we go. So it's funny because the 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 original work, the the Tada Iksun, it's actually was in the going through the process of restoration, but they actually was halted because of many like physical constraints that they were facing. So that, that they now, you know, made this work like live forever in this virtual world, and it can actually have a home you know, in spatial that can be accessed by like millions of people anytime. So, 
So when you have no constraints of distance and, and dimension, and you can invite people over to the kind of experience that you created, what happens, right? So the key thing about the metaverse is that it's not just the fact that you can show in a different dimension without constraint of distance, but you can actually invite people over, and actually it, the experience becomes something that you co-experience. It's something that you, you get to experience together. That's how people build relationships with each other, right? Like when you experience new things uh, together, not just people, I guess, but, um, and you, you really get to um, share your journey with somebody else, and that's how the fundamental way to build the relationship, which is um, really hard uh, when you come to, how do we do that online today? Like you can, yes, share a tweet with each other, but you know it's quite different from getting on this journey um, together. So it, it's, there's, there's something fundamental about having this shared um, experience around you that really you know let people bond with each other. Um, so some of the artists actually shared with us that like before before having a platform like Spatial, like all they can do is to share their art on Twitter and get some likes and follows, but now they can actually have an exhibit online and see how their fans and audiences, followers come in and, and see how they react to their art and how excited they are to feel the energy. So that experience of experiencing art and the creating art is shared, that really helps the, the, the artists like bond better with the, and understand the audiences, and that also leads to the dignity of what you, what you do as an artist, right? It's not just about having more like counts and follows, but it is about how it's being perceived and having this human relationship with the audiences that you, you create this art for. Um, so, yeah. So what happens if you continue to co-experience this experience with uh, other people, right? I think the real opportunities of the metaverse is that it can really turn uh, this internet that's driven by the followers and likes today into the real communities. So that's the real opportunities I want to talk about today um, about the metaverse. So when you have when you have your exhibit and and build like bring in like people, um, and it's not just about like you and that person, but it's also about uh, letting people having relationship like building relationship and connections with other people who share the passion and same values. So it really creates this like external layers around people that's you know run driven by the artists that can help people uh, to build the communities with and having some sharing experience with. So for example, like this, um, the, the Vogue Singapore has this, um, they, their September issue last year has this QR code that leads to this beautiful space uh, in Spatial that, um, that invited a lot of people in when the, 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 the magazine has went, uh, was issued so that the people can now subscribe to the artist's work and they, they actually can try it on together and see like, you know, what they think about each other, like how, you know, what it's like to sort of follow this artist's work and how they think about the art. So they can really bond between the, the, like the people who came in. It's not just about like one person reading the magazine and excited about it. They can share this excitement about like what they think about this art artist's work. And this, another example, which I really like is this, um, uh, it's it's famous DJ Dope Stillo. Can you increase the uh, volume a little bit? Yeah, uh, the Dope Stillo, uh, who's an artist uh, who's regularly hosting a DJ event in Spatial, um, and the music gets a little low, but I really wanted to. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so they can actually host this exhibit. Uh, they, they've been regularly hosting their, their gathering in Spatial, for example, but it's actually not stopping in the metaverse. It's actually now extending into the physical world. So they, so this DJ, when he hosts an event in the, in the real like, stage, like not everyone can make it because of whatever the constraints that they have. So they extended their experience into the metaverse. Um, so people who couldn't make it can actually join you know, online and, and they can have the same experience. So it's, it's really 
you know, helping people to, to build the communities with their stories and with their art. So it's, and, and, and what's more interesting is it's not just about today's communities. It can be about the future communities. So this architecture studio, Dehua Kong, he, he um, asked the 10-year-olds in elementary school that, hey, like, draw the future that you guys think about, uh, you know, what the future should be. And then the children started like scribbling with the crayons um, and, and, and pencils. And they actually started um, drawing this like future that they think is going to happen. So it's, it's kind of depressing because it's actually sunken underneath the water because of climate change. <laughs> it's a warning for us, but well, except for Amsterdam because you're, you figure it out. But um, the, they, it's, they, didn't, they, they don't just stop there. They actually started creating a solution. Uh, and you know, they can now build these underwater cities. And with, like, you know, they have this like, interesting way to kind of breathe it out to, to above the sea level. And, and they, so the architecture studio, the Dewa Kang studio actually built it, turned it into the real spatial space in like a few days. And then they gave it to the children. And, and they're, they're now like coming here and then kind of having fun and socializing with their friends, showing this to their family. And now they can use this as like a sort of online hangout space. And it's, it's all of a sudden like, it was this little idea that's like created by uh, children. And, and that's now in a few days later can live and, and, and experience in real life uh, online. And it's, it's, I thought it was like a really beautiful journey bet uh, for the stories and ideas to, to take form in a way that they can experience online. So there's such a powerful notion of what metaverse can do, turning stories into the real experience that forms communities. Um, I think we talked about a bunch of stuff, and I'm definitely over time. But I <laughs> um, so. I think what we're witnessing is that it's a beginning of, of, of a new era. And it's almost like this map of Amsterdam in 16th centuries. Um, and it, it's waiting to be built. And there are a lot of stories that can be you know, coming in, interwoven with each other. But what I know for sure is that the future of internet, the future of the internet will be more artistic than today. And so, the, I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. Um, can you join me on the sofa so we can just relax? I, well, I'm sure there are many questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I would like to start with a couple. Thanks for also showing a lot of examples. You know, it's always good to see yeah, where the metaverse is at, besides, you know, the, the abstract notion um, that we have. I actually have two questions, but I'm going to start with one. Uh, it's going to be personal. I hope, uh, I hope you don't mind. Um, I checked out your Instagram profile, and I saw that you're a big fan of, uh, of going in nature, right? And forest and mindfulness and, and such, such things. And scrolling down, I saw uh, you saying, oh, I love the forest so much, so great to be here. And then there was a video of you burning virtual logs of wood on a virtual bonfire in a virtual forest in spatial, right? And that really made me think about, you know, the use that we have for these metaverse platforms, right? Like I think Mark Zuckerberg with Meta is really trying to push this kind of metaverse pro for productivity. Brands, whether that's the central end and Snoop Dogg and trying to be the neighbor of Snoop Dogg on, uh, on the central end is really about entertainment. Um, how can we build um, spaces where we can essentially share more meaning, whether that's art, whether that's you know something that is related more to mindfulness and just being together. Um, it's a great, great question uh, and very personal question too. But uh, yeah, I think um, so. So the, there are different ways to think about like what what's going to happen to the metaverse. Um, uh, it, it will. It has, there's an opportunity that metaverse can, can help people to, to be, well actually let's zoom out a little bit and see what's happening in today's internet, right? Like the, a lot of today's internet, it's, it got really abstract that to the point that everyone comes down to like, you know, clicks and likes and, and numbers. So you just get to like mindlessly scrolling through the phone and that becomes like how you spend like six hours a day for a lot of people. And 
uh, what I'm hoping uh, the metaverse can can help to address some of these issues is that it, it can make some of those interaction either more interactive and active, like more human, or can be the actually, uh, uh, you know, better quality exper online experience, like m whether it be mindfulness or helping people to be more present online. And that, I feel like those two kind of angles are um, uh, like actually con like a bit, there's a contrast between these two, but I think for now, today's internet, it's just like, there's two ideas like mashed together, so everything comes down to like same behaviors. Um, so when I think about this, the latter example of what metaverse can do, like helping people to be um, really exposed to kind of better experience that otherwise they, they might not be able to do, um, I think uh, it's, it's just uh, having the right set of you know, rules and, and uh, kind of the tool sets that can help people to use to, that allow people to um, build kind of like meaningful and meditational space with. It's something, all thing you can do. It's almost like designing the cities. You can set the rules and it's not the platform or city, but the architects and like the residents who come in and, and build a story with the sort of like a set of rules that city has laid out and the same for the metaverse. So we really want to help people to like, you know, use some of our elements that we're, we're um, releasing that's, um, some of it is helping people to like um, enjoy yeah, the you know, beautiful sort of sunset and like some natural components that can help people to build, you know, more fluid and meditational experience as well. Um, but ultimately it is, it is not controlled by the platform, but it can be an interaction between the creators and the platform. So. You're mentioning, I think there is a lot of focus, well, in your answer as well, as in, uh, I think, the, just the mission of Spatial on letting people build. And this is reminding me of, um, of a quote of a big uh, video game executive who compared how, how it is to make a movie and how it is to make a game. The difficulty in making a game is that you're not just shooting the movie, you're also building the camera as you're shooting the movie. And so, you know, you're a designer yourself and you find, um, you find yourself in the position, essentially, of setting the rules according to which people then can build the worlds that they wish for the purpose they wish to. So how, how do you design an, these affordances? How do you accommodate uh, for this? Uh, it's definitely difficult. <laughs> and, um, so all, I think, so it's, it comes down to a lot of trials and errors, but the good thing is um, that thankfully our team has a good mixture of like people with like game design background and like more like a traditional tech design background so like they're usually they're they're one kind of you know driving force that try to make everything like really efficient and like clean and they're their other driving force that makes you know try to be very like crafty and artistic so i think have a, having a good blend of those two mentalities are very important to build like amazing experience in the metaverse and uh yeah, and I think uh, it's, it's, you know, I think the part of it is like, if you think about what, who designed the internet for the past uh, decade, it's been, uh, a lot of them were um, the graphical designers and sometimes um, information designers. And I think now going forward, there's gonna be more roles for like 3D like designers, like architects and, and sculptors and visual artists to really chime in and contribute to the, the, the formation of this new internet. Um, so I think that's, it, you just need to have the right people. And <laughs> yeah. I guess that's always the formula. Um, I would like to open to the audience if there is, okay, I see already a question, two, three, four, um, Discord, okay. Wow, it's, uh, the phone is buzzing. Uh, let's start with Discord then. Um, so yeah, we have one question uh, from Discord about the accessibility and the limits of the resources. How do you approach that? Because of course, you know, when maybe the one part of the world is gonna move forward, talking about you know communities and connections and shared experiences, the other one then you know lags back. So how do you approach that? Oh, sorry, can you reiterate the the other one part? I think. 
yeah. well, what is the? How do you solve the problem with limits? Uh, the yeah, limits of the resources and the accessibility of the metaverse that's maybe not necessarily accessible to you know everyone equally. Correct. Um, so yeah, I mean, resources are for sure limited um, given you know the nature of the companies and startups. Um, in terms of how we approach the accessibility, um, we do we do put a lot of emphasis on every technical decision we made, design decision we ever make. Um, it is with the idea that it has to be uh, instantly accessible just like any other website. So uh, there are a lot of metaverses who, who have slightly different priorities. They um, sometimes allow peop ask people to download for 30 minutes and, and do it versus like spatial, it's, it's, it's taking this interesting approach to make sure, making sure that it, it's one click away, but also like, like graphic, like the, the graphic experience, like graphical experience is like almost like AAA games which is a very hard battle, <laughs> but uh, we have been successful so far. And um, in terms of the accessibility beyond um, just like, you know, website and, and how do you make metaverse, you know, really accessible to everyone. Um, so that is very important questions um, that we are always thinking about. And uh, like, for example, we get a lot of feedback from like people who have, um, uh, you know, like problems of, for example, like mobility, and they feel like liberated when they come spatial and navigate, you know, within spatial. Um, so, I think it's it's an important question that we'll continue to answer. But for now, to be honest, our focus has been for now, it's making it low the barriers of entry is like as low as possible and just one click away. So we're probably going to expand the notion of accessibility as we as we continue. So, hi, I'm, I'm I'm just I am very struck by the bland sameness, uh, sterile, um, like the worlds that you show off in spatial all feel so empty, um, and unlivable in a way I'm, I'm really struck by the all the bodies there i have have a sameness they are kind of i, I give an example of my personal life playing vr chat there is an avatar i love which is a beaten up old volkswagen car and there's something amazing about the possibilities of virtual worlds that i can interact with a bunch of strangers as a car and it, it's it's quite I find it quite disappointing thinking that the future of social spaces will be so defined by kind of empty space. Like the, the only space that kind of spoke to the imagination was the space designed by children. And I think, fuck, Vogue, what the fuck are you doing? Sorry for, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like, like, why is it all so, why are the bodies so humanoid and kind of like candles, you know? Like, where, where are the, where's the weird? Um, so, so, sorry, so, if you, so is there a question about like, why, why do we care about? Why, why do you choose to hmm. design a world where in theory everything is possible and make it so sadly realistic? Right. It's like sterile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think the way we think about that is the, so when we, look back at where we started. Like we actually started as uh, the augmented reality platform. So when we, we, I think our major platform right now is the web and mobile, but we do think uh, in the, the very near future, we're gonna have like the immersive technologies available for everyone like augmented reality and virtual reality. So we started as, um, you know, the platform with people, the real people sitting in the room, and there's a holographic version of the other people who are joining from other people, places. So our origin has been uh, about, let's not completely detach ourselves from the reality, but let's augment the reality and metaverse is, is an extension of our, the real physical interaction uh, in the real space. So that sort of, it's more like a historical reason why, like way we 
you know, build, you know, how we build is like what you saw on my presentations. And um, so, but I think the, the, the role of platform is to give people like a spectrum of interactions that you can build instead of, you know, guiding too much about what can be built. But there are people who are building like, you know, like a little blurb as an avatar and they can now add a custom avatars, they can really have superpowers. You actually see a lot more superpowers in, in the very you know, few months that we're actually working on at helping creators to customize their experience. Um, in terms of the space, it's, uh, yeah, it's the, I think the spaces are, are also getting a lot more wilder with this like new interactivity support that we're actually releasing soon. And, um, but, um, yeah, I guess the, it's a great question for our creators, like why it's it's kind of still too tied to the real world and the gravi you know the gravitational constraints. But I mean, part of it is it's still like metaverse is about it's going through this phase where we need to educate the the broader part of the world that hey, this is like relevant to your life and and valuable. And I think that there's a beauty of like still having this middle ground between. Um, completely wild dreamy space to like the real world that everyone understands like what the hell it, this is and so I think metaverse as a field it's, it's kind of in, in, in this stage where it still needs to be educating a lot of broader audiences and that's part of why we, we don't go too wild yet or probably like why our creators are taking this kind of balanced approach so yeah. Uh, I heard that we only have time for one more. Let's make it two. Quick, two quick, two for one. Thank you. Um, I think you can tell a lot about an organization or company based on their financial model or how they monetize. Um, I was thinking you're showing a lot of exhibitions inside the space. Um, do the artists get paid for the work that they're doing? Um, for example, I'm a curator. If I organize an exhibition in a physical museum or gallery, I, we have rules in the Netherlands at least about artist fees. So could you share a little bit more about um, how you monetize your platform and your financial model? Right. Um, so one good thing for the artists and bad thing for us has been, it's been mostly free for the past uh, past, past two years. And um, um, so a lot of artists, they had an exhibit and they could sell their art um, not necessarily directly through us, but like on whatever platform that they're comfortable with. And that's been happening a lot. Um, but the, the way that we think about the monetization going forward is that we're, we're adding, um, like we need to kind of, we really want to in align our incentive to, and, and the creator's incentive. And, and we're gonna have like marketplace where they can directly sell their art and items and, and powers and ability. Uh, online and that can go go to the creators and we have we're gonna have like really creator friendly kind of like a commission structure um, and there are other ways that we were able, like the, it, there's like a notion of events that you can kind of apply getting our help to host like a giant, like big events and there's like a different business models that are attached to that um, experiences um, but yeah um, that's the that's primary way for us to monetize right now. Okay, last one now. Okay, so... Oh, Jesus, so many. Uh, it's, um, it's something that interested me today. I googled it um, to, to understand the relation between the technology and human capabilities. Apparently, right now, the resolution we see is about 20 times higher than the highest tech 8K monitor, but seeing that Moore's law has been proven correct since the 60s, that technology is doubling in every area at least every year. So this means in a couple of years, we, sh we can be able to create an AI space that's higher definition than us. Is this, can we still, can we still see it or what would it be? It's a really mind boggling question for me. It, it, it comes back to the question, you know, the old age dilemma where you say, can God create a stone that he cannot lift? Can humans create an environment they cannot process? And is that then the matrix? I don't know. <laughs> I 
<laughs> well, well, first of all, our world is already a higher definition than we can see. Like if we dissect our skins and you know molecules, and they're always more than we can see. I feel like there's gonna be a sort of you know um, the limitations, uh, not limitations, but um, like th if, if 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 the graphics quality can go through a certain threshold, like it will probably stop mattering as much as it is today. And and because um, our unless we evolve further, so have like higher definition eyes, so um, it is it is definitely a, a bit scary and interesting kind of ideas to think that. You know, in, in in soon we'll not be able to distinguish the virtual reality experience and and the physical reality. Uh, but I don't I don't think it's like it's that honestly like close to to kind of where we are. And um, it's it's the big part of it's like a haptics, for example, like the feeling, the physical presence with each other, and this like basic sense of touch. It's like probably like so far so so far from um, being able to replicate this this feeling and in terms of that but i think even if we the role as a designer if you assume that that some version of that future happens is to really design the right rules um that everyone can participate in and agree with so we have like a good sort of sane kind of lifestyles within the virtual reality even if it's you know um replacing or or taking a big portion of our day-to-day -day life so um there that's definitely something that we think about a lot but uh i, I wouldn't worry or uh be scared about um too much because of the timeline of it is, is actually I, I i don't think it's i don't think it should be the right goal like the way we think about the metaverse is it's instead of replacing our physical lives i, I would like to think of it as like we already spend so much time online and how can we make those experiences more human and interactive and you know more real so that that is um uh, more of our kind of approach than let's replace our what we do in the physical world today so yeah well thanks everyone for the questions there is the lunch break now so there is yeah more time i guess to discuss more informally also with jinha jinha thanks a lot thank you See you all this afternoon. This is going to be such a rich conversation today. I'm super excited to get into it. First, we have some presentations uh, from both of the artists. Um, I'm not sure who's first. Um, um, I can go first. Uh, that sounds you. great. Peter, take us away. <laughs> OK. Um, there we go. Can we see this? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks, Wade. Um, and uh, hi, Katya, and hi, everybody out there. Uh, my name is Peter, and I'm an artist based in Los Angeles, and I'm the creator of Epoch, which is an experimental virtual gallery that was created during the quarantine and early 2020. Um, I'm just going to go through some images of previous exhibitions. To date, there are 14 that uh, have been done on the exhibition uh, epoch.gallery. You can go to the site and you can kind of see all the exhibitions. There's actually one piece that is showing physically at the, the space where you guys are at now, I believe. Um, and it's called Replicants and I'll go through that. But this is the first exhibition called End Demo. And uh, so when the quarantine happened, all us artists lost opportunities and whatnot. So uh, I thought, why not try to start a virtual exhibition space? And uh, at that point, uh, a lot of online things were just like, online exhibitions were just like flat kind of uh, website based oriented thing. And I thought that, <coughs> excuse me, to do something that was more kind of, um, you know, 3D like and whatnot. So the very first one is uh, based on this little white island here and it's crumbling and I'm just trying to capture the sentiment of how we're all feeling during the quarantine, which is, you know, we're very isolated and alone. And also kind of commenting on kind of the, this crumbling, uh, you know, detritus of uh, the gallery walls and the institutions that are kind of, you know, kind of uh, not holding up to the test of the quarantine. 
So um, I asked a lot of artists to be in this first exhibition, but um, none of them really wanted to be in it for some reason. I didn't think they, they, they really understood what it was, but I asked a lot of my really close friends and they all agreed. And this is the first exhibition, uh, which you can still see on the, ex on the, the website. Um, I'm just gonna go through some exhibitions. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm just gonna go through maybe uh, four or five of them and, uh, and focus more on exhibitions that take uh, the architecture from late capitalistic kind of like structures and then replace them into these virtual environments. Um, kind of when I do that, it's creating a sort of a tether to the real world. And so I'm uh, trying to create these commentaries of what's going on. Uh, momentarily. So Epoch in a certain way is kind of like a, 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 a analogy or, or of everything that has gone on for the past three, two and a half years since Epoch has begun, almost three years actually. Um, so this is uh, the fifth exhibition called Phantom Limb. And um, this is the Amundsen building, the LACMA Amundsen building that was in Los Angeles that was getting demolished and was quite a controversial thing here. And so I recreated the Amundsen building as it was being demolished and uh, organized a bunch of artists that are uh, Latinx. So 90% of them were Latinx and kind of talking about the idea of representation and the issues with that within this Kremlin institution. You can see here the actual Amundsen building getting destroyed and um that's what we got so you can go through the whole exhibition and walk through the islands and kind of submerged in this post-apocalyptic way um this is one this is a uh, wonderland which is the seventh exhibition so this is actually a photo of the actual castle that is based in china where uh um so china tried to create this disneyland theme park and um, they had conflicts with the people there that were owning the farmland. And so they couldn't finish the project. So it became this kind of like um, a ruin in itself, this kind of like modern, late capitalistic ruin. And then so I lifted the castle and placed it into the virtual environment and curated, um, I think, nine um, Chinese American diaspora artists within the exhibition during the height of the anti Asian sentiment here in the US. Um, I think when the show was released, uh, nine days later, I think, was when the Atlanta, sh Atlanta, uh, Atlanta shootings uh, were happening. So um, yeah, so the exhibition has, I didn't really ask the artists um, what to put in for this exhibition. They all put in some things that were very macabre and uh, solemn, and I think that really captured the sentiment of the, the, the what was going on. Okay, this is the, um, I'm not, you could all kind of go through in each exhibition and see the artistry artworks. I'm just kind of showing you the overall right now. Um, this is the eighth exhibition called Freeport. And so um, this is during the time in 2021, I believe, uh, then February around when the um, NFT boom was happening. So what I did was, uh, was trying to think uh, what to do for that because a lot of artists were coming to me and they're saying, well, you're kind of poised to kind of, uh, kind of enter the scene. And I was like, okay, how am I going to do it? So I first thought where are we going to do it? So, um, and I was looking online with all these marketplaces and everything was like, all these JPEGs were stuck together next to each other. And there was such a kind of gluttonous thing happening. And so I kind of wanted to focus on uh, certain artists. So I think there are eight artists in this exhibition. And um, this architectural, well, this building is from um, Luxembourg. So it's the Luxembourg Freeport. So if anybody doesn't know what free ports are, free ports are places that are tax free, free zones where really, really rich people hold their uh, valuables. And so I found the elevations and uh, floor plans online and I recreated the Luxembourg free port. And um, so it was kind of an ironical way of talking about NFTs because maybe NFTs in a certain way you can get away with tax evasion itself as well. So it was kind of this cheeky way of kind of talking about it. But in while doing this, I also created the smart contract, which was equitable, which uh, splits all the proceeds uh, from each sale. Uh, 
uh, to all the artists. And I also thought of this way, well, I didn't want to sell individual works. So I, um, the whole exhibition as a standalone app was offered. So when you buy the NFT, you get a whole standalone app that works on Mac and OS and uh, Windows. And it, uh, you can see it in VR and it's an 8K with high res audio. And um, you can kind of go through the exhibition and that's how the things are offered as NFTs. Um, this is the inside of the Luxembourg Freeport. It's something that's quite actually brutalistly beautiful, but no one can actually enter it because it's not a public space. So it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of opening that uh, space up. So this is my rendering of that space. And you can see Alice Bucknell's <laughs> alligator in the back. And so if you, you can kind of go through and, and you can kind of go through all the, the, the chambers and all these kinds of rooms that are actually from the Luxembourg Freeport. Um, this is the 10th exhibition, which is Echo. So the previously I just showed the Amundsen building destroyed. So this is the second part of the LACMA series that I'm doing. And there's a third part coming at the end of this year or near the end of this year. So I was asked by the LACMA Art and Tech Lab uh, and commissioned to create this work where I actually remodeled all of Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles from the Academy Museum all the way to the tar pits. So you can walk all the way through and see uh, the whole street and everything. And I got it to a certain point where even the parking meters that were skewed, I, uh, I replicated those. And all the artists in here are previous and um, current, at that time, current um, art and tech lab recipients from the grants that they have. And so we curated this kind of uh, public exhibition where all these works are outside in the space and you can't actually enter really any buildings um, that are actually on site there. So the Amundsen building, when it was dis demolished, this, this is where it is located, where it was located. And now you are starting in this excavation area of the space here. Um, so this is where the new LACMA building is going to be created. And um, uh, yeah, so here is another shot right here to the right here. You see the Japanese pavilion. And then back here with a huge kind of looming structure here is by Ralph, uh, Ralph Sanfratello, which is an architect, speculative, fiction, speculative architectural uh, duo. I think the based, in, one of them is based in Los Angeles, another one's somewhere else. And um, so they thought about, okay, there's a big homeless crisis here in Los Angeles and how do, do they kind of uh, address that in a certain way. So they created this huge kind of structure that has all these uh, uh, like little module kind of building or rooms that you could kind of, that people could live in. But it's it's quite this kind of, in the, in the exhibition is really quite this kind of looming specter over Los Angeles. And I think it was quite apropos for what they were trying to do. Um, so this is replicants. So you may see this work in the uh, shown there at previously where you guys are at. And so um, I did the similar thing. So this is based in Hong Kong. I was asked to be an exhibition or Epoch was asked to be in the exhibition in Hong Kong. And I asked uh, the gallery, well, why don't we do something really special and we recreate the gallery space where you're located and the whole street. So this is Queens Road in Hong Kong. And this is just kind of really during the, the time when Hong Kong was protesting against uh, uh, China and fighting for the democracy. And um, so the whole layout to the left here, you see uh, the, the gallery and uh, I'll go through some images here. Um, and it has, this, the show is called Replicants. So it's kind of like this obviously Blade Runner treatment. And um, so a lot of the works that are in the show are actually reproductions of things that are in real life, um, but that sometimes sometimes things are not the case. Okay, so this is um, Chen Chen and um, Tierra's work, um, and so this is like kind of this goddess that that there's this cable A A A A G. I think I'm I'm getting that right. This cable that runs across the Pacific, and it's connecting. Uh, 
uh, all of us uh, why, uh, through the internet and stuff like that. So this is Gordon Chung's work. He's based in London. And uh, these are actual reproductions of these kinds of screens that are made of paper and pulp and newspaper. Uh, and uh, he's created these kinds of these kinds of window type things that are interesting. And they're installed very similar to how they are in real life. And you can see in the background here, the walls are actually uh, from uh, Blade Runner. Um, so they're kind of like from Frank Lloyd Wright's kind of architectural designs. This is another work from Gordon Chung on the building up here. Um, and this is a very slow, so he takes Renaissance paintings and kind of uh, animates them a certain way. So they become swipes and kind of removing their kind of uh, colonialist uh, history. This is Galatea's work and they created this robot arm that puts makeup on people. So this idea of trust and how to trust the robot uh, to do this kind of certain thing. Oh, and this is Katya's work here. Uh, and uh, she created uh, the, the recreated the owl from Blade Runner. And uh, yeah, she can talk about that more later if she wants. <laughs> and let's see how much time I have. Uh, I think I'm okay on time. Okay, so this is the current exhibition. Uh, it's called Xenospace. It has a really great list of artists. And this is something a little different where uh, we are responding to AI and uh, the kind of what's going on and how we can use AI as a tool rather than in a, in a post uh, uh, text to image and post image to image time and how artists are kind of responding to that. I guess I can, I think I have a little bit of time. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but let me just show you a little quick run through of this. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the exhibition. Um, so let me go back here. So it starts out in the server room, and I'm just going to mute it. And it starts out in the server room. It becomes the initial image. So each uh, room has a, each has a different artist. And this is the initial image. So this is actually not AI generated, the background. Um, it, becomes, uh, it becomes the initial image for all the other backgrounds to be created through uh, AI. So I use stable diffusion. And it was a really kind of tricky way to create high res 360 panoramas, which really there is no roadmap to do. So I figured out how to do this. So this is Ziyang Wu and Mark Ramos's work. And um, they've created, <laughs> Ziyang created these uh, really amazing sculptures uh, that are 3D generated based on Twitter, um, trending Twitter um, hashtags. And they kind of like drop from the sky. So he creates one each day and they kind of like drop the sky. I think that's automated at this point. Um, this is Connie Baschke's work, and this is set in this kind of gothic kind of room. So you can see the server room, the lights that from having from the server room are kind of transported in this, and it's kind of keeping the structure of the server room, but it's kind of putting this kind of gothic architecture into this. And I'm just going to go through these really quick, as I, I want to give Cassio some time as well. So this is Anna Marie Cabarella's work, and uh, she's an NFT poet, or she's a poet and an artist that also does NFT works. And this is set in this kind of library, destroyed library type situation. This is Harvey Moon's work. And he, what he does is he creates, uh, he's, he took all, all of the info, all this data from how ants create their colonies. And then he created these kinds of 3D sculptures from that. And this is kind of set in this kind of uh, laboratory situation. This is Libby Henney's work. And she's based from the UK and she works with quantum computing and is doing some really interesting things with uh, a video game that she's producing. Um, and this is uh, Eddie Wong's work. I think he was nominated for the Lumen Prize. And th this work that he is creating here is also AI generated um, that is talking about the decolonization of, uh, of uh, or the colonization of Malaysia and stuff. So this is in this war torn ruins. Um, whoops, I got lost here. Okay. Uh, okay. And then there's another work that I'm, oh, hold on, let me go to that here. Okay. And this is Cross Lucid's work here. And they're a duo based out of Berlin. And this is some really trippy, surreal uh, uh, hallucinations from AI. And they create these also these kind of 3D sculptures as well. 
But if you go to Anna Maria's work, there's a special door here opposite of her video. And if you go here, you can experience it yourself. I'll stop here. But there's also another seven installations and backgrounds. So this is Ziang's work. Again, different video, different uh, uh, sculptures. And this is obviously in the newsroom situation. And you can kind of go through and see all the work. So this is Cross Luce's work in this kind of really trippy uh, <laughs> stalagmite cave. So the prompt was stalagmite cave and it gave me these kinds of weird kinds of forms and stuff like that. But the textures are really quite crazy. So you can experience that yourself. I'm gonna give it to Katia and then, um, and then uh, uh, we can have a conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. Super interesting um, and inspiring. Uh, should I just start? Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Katya. The the stage yeah. is yours. Okay. I'll quickly uh, share my screen. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Do we see it? Yeah. It looks great. Okay. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Katya. I am an artist. I've been sort of um, active, full on active for 10 to 12 years. And I will start with a little timeline um, of my work uh, that uh, connects to, to kind of more recent um, times and the ideas of metaverse. Um, so my work started basically with the question of what is a viral image or which, why some images are successful and some are not on, in the early days of social media. Um, and the trend that I kind of noticed uh, that everybody else obviously noticed as well is that cute animals um, are a successful format for an image to be shared and liked. And that's still the case um, in all the newer social media um, contexts. And what I did was simple. I just isolated some of these cute signals from the internet and I printed them as cut out um, sculptures. And that was an experiment to see if the, something that is viral on the internet can also be somehow successful uh, in a gallery space or get a certain attention from people. So this became a series called Approximations. Uh, and I could talk a lot about it, but I'm not going to, so I'm just going to show them. Uh, this was a series that had several dozens of work, I believe. Um, and they all had to be a strong, strong signal um, kind of image. And they were all printed quite large, human size and larger. Um, but in, back in 2013, um, I did a sort of a collaboration or project for uh, this, um, and the project was called This Images, and my uh, contribution was called Future Growth Approximations, where I ex expanded on this idea of a cute animal uh, as being like a strong attention uh, grabbing signal. And I also somehow um, introduced uh, this element of a of economical growth arrow. And the project, uh, this images was a project uh, about creating basically a series of uh, stock images. And back then a stock image was like the most um, literal like way an image could be uh, part of economy because things sort of used to be free on the internet except stock images where, you know, if you want to have a high quality generic image, you buy it as a stock image. So this curated a group of artists to design their kind of stock image collections. Um, and uh, I used the actual stock image gro economical growth arrows and created these like uh, sculpture mock-ups in, in empty gallery spaces with uh, economical growth arrows, basically kind of speculating on the nature of art in the age of the internet. Um, and uh, very logically, uh, I started to make these things as real installations. Uh, and my sort of experiment worked out in the sense that it did provide me kind of um, 
a successful path in in the art world, uh, successful enough that I'm still an active actively working as an artist. And these installations were made um, very physical. The, the, this kind of this idea of translating something very ephemeral and stupid almost, and kind of a cheap image, a poor, uh, poor image, as uh, quoting uh, Hito style, um, into like a physical, fully fully material installation was an interesting uh, transition for me. Um, and uh, yes, um, I think that we're stuck on your first slide. You might want to restart the screen share. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm no worries, I just realized. Yes. Do you see it now? More? Uh, yes, try uh, changing the slide. Yeah, I, your screen sharing is paused. It says, um, one moment. That's so cute, though. Uh, what is the uh wait should i stop share do you see something else no right now it's just you um okay then i'm gonna reshare it wait a second uh now do you yes. see but maybe okay. um if you I mean, maybe on... i'm i'm not gonna go in full screen maybe then or yeah, so. good idea. That's this is exactly. perfect. Yeah, so these are the works I've been talking in this approximation series. Um, eh, animals, different animal sculptures. Yes, and then we go into the this project with the arrows. This images. These are the series of stock images with uh, economical growth arrows. Um, and then we go into what I call patterns of activations, which are installations that are physical uh, that I've been doing um, that are somehow a translation of uh, digital uh, representation into a physical installation. And the idea of like the value of the image versus the value of an installation and art, physical art and in the age of the internet. <laughs> Um, and, uh, one thing that I was, uh, became curious about to, uh, around, um, uh, I don't know, eight years ago is, um, the idea of machine vision and algorithmic vision, uh, has entered the chat basically. And, um, the topic of image processing like large scale image processing, uh, became relevant. And I somehow noticed like, um, a relationship between what I'm what I was doing intuitively to kind of an algorithmic logic where I would process an image online and I guess basically use my eyes as an algorithm to identify a shape that is a strong signal and I take it um, make it like into a physical uh, separate uh, uh, object basically. Uh, so I became uh, more interested in not not stock images type of uh, content and not social media type of content, but images that were basically just um, data points in a in a data set in a in a database. Uh, and specifically to continue the topic of animals, uh, I became very intrigued by large data sets that were available online of things like um, trail cam um, footage that was recorded in uh, like hundreds of thousands uh, large um, um, data sets. And they, these types of um, uh, collections were often uploaded online to, to be indexed by volunteers, human volunteers who were invited to index these types of uh, footage uh, uh, in order to train the algorithm actually, or in order to give like a statistically sane um, and sound uh, um, way of processing these giant data sets that small research groups were not able to process. And in the while while indexing these images, I used to come across these sort of magical compositions and magical 
uh, moments that were caught on by automatic cameras somewhere in the middle of the night in like Australia or um, or in Kenya or in uh, some like Wisconsin forest. Um, and I started to translate these um, images into kind of play works. The, um, what would be things that kind of look like uh, almost like a cave art or a fresco, an old fresco um, on the wall, this sort of naturally corrupted image that was already pretty low res and pretty uh, full of artifacts. Um, and uh, entering the the era that um, Peter started with, the sort of the era, era of the quarantine and the era of um, NFTs, I, um, as uh, many artists, I was sort of stuck at home uh, and I uh, gradually switched to thinking about uh, making a work more digital. Um, and this I will show you. I'm, this is sort of how the NFT that is on view now in the, the Bali. Um, and this was a way for me to translate this data, data set logic into a work. So I made a GIF for a platform called Feral File. Um, and uh, it's one of the it's sort of a standalone NFT edition. Um, and this is the this is the work. So it's just uh, each image is one twenty fourth of a second. So it's a frame, uh, and it's basically they move faster than a human eye can process. Uh, and that was kind of for me a way to uh, combine the idea of a human vision versus a machine vision. Like what is what part of the uh, image do we recognize and part, what part of the image is just sort of a pixel that is being processed and how algorithms identify shapes and meanings. Um, then I go to the next project. Um, the next project is called Microbial Oasis and this is also, this is sort of this big, um, this is a 2021 project, uh, so height of uh, also lockdown still. I collaborated with an um, artist so i i had to do a solo exhibition in the netherlands but in the context where i couldn't really go to my studio so i worked from home uh, uh online and uh, the the exhibition had to be still physical but the beginning of the project was very much a digital research so i collaborated with the german artist maximilian kreis and we scraped a website called protein data bank it's a a uh, public online platform that stores uh, all digital models of known proteins and virus um, shapes and parts of proteins and stuff like that. And they exist in different formats, but we scraped all the PNGs and JPEGs from the website. And we use the StyleGAN to algorithm to generate potentially, uh, potentially viable, potentially possible but artificial synthetic uh, forms that could be a virus or could be a protein shape, but they were, um, you know, AI generated. So this was sort of this uh, early response to AlphaFold um, algorithm that was developed by uh, Google. Um, and the result was pre pretty interesting. Uh, we got a lot of shapes that were for style again too. It was pretty good. Um, they uh, looked like viruses, they looked like protein models. But to my surprise, maybe 1% of our results looked like a kind of a mask or human face. And we, um, I isolated all these sort of masks and, I, and they, they were definitely not in our training uh, data. They were not in our algorithm that they were probably in the core of StyleGAN2 itself. And we sort of, it kind of got exposed to sort of human face of the algorithm got exposed to us. Uh, so I made a basically like a portrait, uh, uh, a series of portraits uh, out of these masks that uh, talk about, um, and of course this was all with the background of 
the talk whether COVID was a lab um, engineered or uh, kind of natural. Um, so uh, the idea for me was to think of um, generation of something like protein as a form of um, uh, ex an experimental practice, but also as uh, a comment on like bioweapons. <laughs> uh, and the reason for the bioweapon angle was because the exhibition took place in an old arsenal, uh, so like a weapon storage building uh, in the Dutch fort, military fort from 17th century, 18th century, I believe. So the building was a military arsenal storage. And instead of kind of storing junk, uh, like big piles of metal, um, it was about creating uh, sort of a portrait gallery out of these uh, protein AI um, portraits and uh, results. And in the middle of the exhibition, there was also a video where kind of the, the forms were mutating. And uh, uh, this was the exhibition. Uh, in the same year, I was working with a group of people on uh, an NFT project called Mutagen. Uh, and uh, it came the, the title came from a different angle, but uh, it really matched with my already research on microbial oasis. And the Mutagen was about us basically making um, a series of NFTs that would mutate uh, with each sale and they would mutate uh, towards uh, various degrees of rareness and and there were like surprises in there and uh, in each image would there would be four layers that would be mutating so this is an example of like one um one nft and all its possible not all of its possible mutations but some possible mutations and as you can see i was sort of combining the footage from the wild camps and the generated viruses and the, the idea kind of of mutation with versus code um, was the core for me in this project. Um, so just showing you quickly. And then I'm actually going to replicants. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is another example where it all makes sense. Now, why would I kind of be using the owl in this and make it as this sort of sculpture because it, it it's a direct throwback to my early work, but also it's a throwback to sort of the core of what was the owl idea in the movie Blade Runner, which is this basically a synthetic creature that also has a unique barcode, which could be like a, you know, we could say that all the replicants in the movie probably existed in a met within a certain metaverse with their uh, on the blockchain. <laughs> You can also think of that because if maybe somebody remembers even uh, the snake and the owl and every every sort of synthetic living creature in within the Blade Runner universe had a unique number, um, serial number, and um, and also this idea of a kind of something living that is not quite living that is a uh, that is a, a, an object and a subject that is for sale kind of at the same time. that has been interesting. There's another screenshot from replicants. And that is obviously the economical growth arrow that we used as, um, as uh, a vitrine, a neon vitrine. Um, do I have time? I can stop now or I can talk about two other little projects. I can stop if, if, if you want. You've got two minutes, Katya. Okay, that's good. I'll I'll uh, I'll then quickly go to uh, the other sort of experiment from the last couple of years with NFT and and sort of the all these topics that I discussed that are, I'm trying to to condense in one project was a collaboration with uh, Kevin, who did all these beautiful visual um, uh, material for for the festival. Uh, and me, I don't know how it will look here, but um, basically me and uh, Kevin, we did this um, a series of videos. No, it doesn't really work, but let's see. We did a little uh, sort of looping video uh, clips for a platform called Voice. I was a resident in Voice um, and I invited Kevin and uh, Alexandra to um, to 
work on these together, uh, Alexander Martin Serrano. Um, and we basically generated something that I, uh, <clears throat> I basically refer to as biblical angels. <laughs> so if anybody is aware of this meme of a biblical angel where they look absolutely like horrific with uh, a myriad of eyes and, uh, and weird body architectures, uh, we decided to kind of think of what if, uh, you know, what if biblical angels is a representation of like a biotechnological chimera, like chimera. Uh, and we made these little videos. Um, and again, I'm just like showing you that in, I've been sort of experimenting with different formats and technologies in the last few years because I think the space now is up for experimentation. And that's, I think, is the most exciting sort of um, uh, outcome from the NFT boom, but also in generally the transition to more digital uh, environments. Um, and this is the last project I'm sharing, which is Earthware PBD. So um, the next last year, already 2022, I took a step uh, further and I wanted still to experiment with generating protein structures. Um, but instead of using a style again, I uh, was using um, this is Doll E. And I um i generated another series of possible biological structures um and they all have like little venn diagrams as their backgrounds but um the idea is i keep coming back to this idea that there is this potential now to merge the computational with biological and that you can kind of explore that in one way or another and i made the i made them back into physical translation uh, with this series of, again, these uh, clay works. So um, sort of getting back to um, to physical has been my uh, kind of current state um, and trying to find, again, new p possibilities where both are possible, where you can still have something just as a virtual uh, digital model and then somehow have a relationship with the physical object. I'm still sort of looking for the most interesting way to explore that. Um, I really love to what Peter is doing. So I uh, would love to now have our conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Katya. And thank you, Peter, as well. Those were awesome presentations. Um, and really inspired a lot of thought for me. Um, particularly, I think, you know, what I'm really interested in um, to start us off is, uh, of course, both of your works are incorporating elements of the physical or the natural world and bringing them into a virtual space. Um, and when we think about the metaverse and what that means and all the various components that comprise it, why is it important for both of you to, or how do you navigate the relationship between bringing in elements from a physical or or a perceived world into um, a virtual or imaginary world that you're creating? Um, for me, I, I usually am lifting things that are uh, sometimes politically or socially politically charged and then replacing them because I think it obviously creates some kind of weird tether to uh, what we can have a conversation with uh, what's actually going on and uh, that's what I that's what I choose that stuff. I think specifically, you know, Peter, in thinking about your work, when you, as you were reconstructing the environment of, you know, downtown Los Angeles, what, you know, what kind of aspects were important for you to capture or to translate over um, into the experience for the viewer? And but also at the same time, what did you want to break or make different about this kind of um, more fantastic representation of, of a place that, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people pass through every day. Yeah. Um, so usually like with Freeport or um, previous exhibitions so that there's certain uh, a post-apocalyptic kind of uh, lens that goes over top and is treated that way. But for the, the Echo show with the LACMA, um, which has been acquired by the LACMA recently, um, is um, I really kind of wanted it to be pretty much one-to-one -one, and I didn't want to really kind of uh, uh, 
kind of have this kind of speculative fiction aspect to it because I think it was kind of already uh, the realism of it was so uncanny that it, it cre created this kind of really weird uh, uh, sensation that it was just so you can actually go to the LACMA and hold up the, the, the phone and uh, bring up the exhibition and you can actually if you're standing in the same place, you can kind of like overlay it in a certain way. Um, but it, I really want to keep that one pretty much one to one and kind of uh, have the, the works in the exhibition kind of create that kind of tension between um, what was going on and, and stuff. So like Sarah Rara's work, which were these kind of mosquitoes uh, on these kinds of huge billboard kind of screens along the Wilshire Boulevard, uh, we're talking about um, the idea of, uh, of realtors and the blood sucking realtors essentially that's why she used the idea of the, the the mosquito but interestingly also when artists are putting these things in the spaces so she got a commission from that to do actually billboards within los angeles so there's this kind of weird parallel or pop in the jump from the virtual so from the real world to the virtual and the virtual to the real world. So there's kind of this cross pollination thing that's always happening and the cross pollination itself, where you guys are showing the replicant show, which is a group show within a group show type situation. So there's all these kinds of weird things that are happening. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's late. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> Katia, how do you, how do you approach, how do you approach this? I mean, in a lot of cases, I think in your work, we're seeing elements of digital imaging practices of screen culture, um, uh, you know, kind of conversely brought into a physical space and made, and that kind of jarring distinction between them is made quite present. I also th I'm thinking about um, other works, you know, other sculptures of yours that kind of have, um, glass-like or almost a 3D rendered element or quality to them, um, you know, mm -hmm. almost simulating the metaverse in the gallery space. And so, I don't know, how do you think about this, this tension or this active translation across, across worlds? Yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of, for me, this is realism. This is realism as like our, we're constantly switching our eyes from the screen to real world, the screen to real world. And so there's obviously like formally, you can just blur that, you know, that you look up at an object and you see something that looks more like a 3D rendering or um, kind of you look into it, obviously like a digital file, but it has this like weird roughness or rawness that is actually like low res, but it somehow looks more realistic. Now I'm here is this tension between something that is very like glossy 3D versus very low res and artifact, uh, full of artifacts and this sort of, like for example, why why does security footage always look like low res and artifacty, but that's real? Or like actually, like for example, now any most of the military footage from like the war in Ukraine, it's all just this very grainy image, but that makes it feel real. Versus uh, you know within like a metaverse, everything is like super highly rendered to look realistic, but it's obviously like a synthetic landscape. So there's this you know there's a serious way of thinking about that um so there's real realism in artificiality and artificiality and like realism basically so that's uh, i find that uh fascinating and i also also understand why like um you know if you're building a, like the 3d environments this sort of post-apocalyptic um uh angle uh, that peter often uses actually makes it seem more real you know if you just build like uh, things that are just too clean it doesn't feel um, real and so there's this interesting um, it's i think it has to do with how we're processing um a reality with how our brains process reality um, but also for me the other more philosophical question is uh, not really philosophical but it's it's a bit meta is the idea of a model so like for example um, you know, all these protein models, they're models of the real thing. And the real thing is just this slimy, tiny, organic uh, matter that, get, that then gets digitized into DNA sequences. And the DNA sequences get, um, they are calculated into like sort of protein shapes, 3D protein shapes. And then you can use that to generate potentially new protein shapes, um, just with new sequences and new uh, 
new um, branches and stuff. And then now you have it. Then you have also the ability to kind of print that or develop that for real back to wet matter. And then this whole loop uh, is potentially world changing. So I want to understand the loop between computation and and physical matter, be it a, an organism, a cell, a virus, or an iPhone. And I think this is this the the question then of ownership: Who owns these models? What are the algorithms that approximate these models or um, generate new ones? Who owns them? You know, all this spectrum of questions uh, I find fascinating. And of course, maybe you don't see them all answered or stated out directly in my work, but it's all in the background uh, for me. Absolutely. Um, we don't have a ton of time left, actually, uh, but I do have one more question for for both of you. Um, you know, one thing that I think right now, especially as the metaverse is the the term metaverse is on the forefront of everyone's mind. It's obviously the title of um, this conference. Um, you know, why is it important? You know, Katya, you're mentioning this, you know, this tension between the 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 physical and the virtual um, and kind of our, our perception of both. Um, but why, you know, for both of you, why is it important to explore these topics and to explore these tensions right now? Um, what's going on? You know, why should we be focusing our att attention to understanding the how these things map or don't map? Um, and why is and, and why should we? Um, you know, how do you want to see these kinds of explorations develop um, as we kind of go deeper into <laughs> into the metaverse? Katja, you can take that one. Yeah, me? Oh, um, yeah, I don't, uh, to be honest, like, um, I, I don't know if we're going deeper into the metaverse or we're still like kind of our ankles deep mm -hmm. in and we're trying to just new, understand this new physics. Like we're in this new weird environment and we're still, I feel like ankles deep because of a lot of different limitations uh, techno te technically still I find, um, but also because um, there's just so um, much of it and different parts move with different speed. You know, there's these artists who are doing amazing projects, but there's like, almost little audience that can grasp what's going on or platforms that can kind of host uh, these types of projects versus as we were discussing a majority of the sort of art as we know is still pretty much off offline and painting based and all that kind of stuff and and then there's the gaming world and then there's the uh, kind of the, the digital uh um collectible world and then and then all these things are somehow overlapping uh, I have no idea where it's going to redevelop. I'm just, I just have a very narrow angle of my own interest. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm trying to move forward, um, kind of with, uh, uh remaining, we're kind of keeping some sort of form of criticality, but all, uh, also at the same time, I feel like I'm always behind because there's just so much new developments and, um and and i think that's maybe the best part of it is that we're ankles deep and everybody can experiment and there's that's that's where the point we're at where it's going to go it's difficult to say really for me because it's just um it's just too many variables <laughs> for my brain to process maybe you know actually better you have a better grasp of it yeah. Um, so, I mean, the metaverse, I mean, when the whole conversation is toward talking about the metaverse and stuff like that, and, this, you know, this isn't the first incarnation. I mean, we had uh, a second life, too, in a certain way, but it was it, a certain way. There was a certain idea of a utopic kind of thing about thinking about the metaverse and stuff. But I mean, with every tool, uh, whether it be, you know, fire itself or the atomic bomb or social media or, or the metaverse or even AI where we are now, um, it's so fast and, and everything is happening so fast that, that, that there's no criticality that is happening. So everything usually starts very utopic and then it really becomes and it becomes uh, changed into something that's quite destructive for ourselves. And, you know, I, I you know, the metaverse is something that, um, 
it, it just can't, I don't see it happening right now. I mean, if we're talking about this whole thing where everybody can kind of share files between things, that's not going to happen because all the, the, the protocols and everything are different. So that, that whole utopic thing has died. But um, for AI, it's, it's even, I mean, I think we're in a really kind of dangerous place right now because um, the technology itself, I mean, we're talking about creating uh, uh, protogens and kind of different viruses. So this thing can kind of, kind of replicate it. We don't know what's happening because it's a black box, you know what I'm saying? So people, they're like, well, put feed this, these, these proteins and these things and viruses into the AI and it'll cut something, spit something out that may cure cancer. But then, um, and then the lab won't know why it's doing it. And they'll just, the companies will just try to sell it. And then somehow we have zombies or the last of us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, I agree. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a pro utopia. I don't. Know. I, if it sounded like I have that, I'm not pro utopian. No, no, I think we are very aligned that way. Yeah, utopic as well. I'm not dystopic. I'm somewhere in the middle where we're trying to kind of, I mean, I mean, the utopic part for Epoch is really kind of showcasing artists like you and 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 uh, working with people that really <laughs> believe in certain things, and but also has a lens that are, you know, it's not so great sometimes, and kind of having this kind of. Uh, uh, you know, the lens of uh, how the world may be and how we can try to address it and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, wait, are you supposed to take comments from uh, Discord or something? You know what, guys, I think we are out of time. Um, so unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take comments from the audience. Um, sorry, guys. No worries. Uh, I know that everybody is in the space physically right now. You're anxious for the next session. Um, we really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, thanks to uh, thanks to the organizers for having us um, and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao, Thank you. everybody. Thank you. Bye.